Gibson, Pittsburgh's own, is now the official, according to Major League Baseball, all-time career leader in batting average at 372. He also leads in all-time slugging, all-time OPS, and other categories. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins in the same place that you found this. Mr. Gibson, of course, never had the opportunity to play for the Pirates. He never had the opportunity to play in the major leagues. He performed at an extraordinary level for 17 years in the Negro Leagues as a member of both the Pittsburgh Crawfords and the Homestead Grays, having been signed at age 16 and having stuck with it until his tragic early passing in his mid-30s. Got to tell you, I'm not one of those people who had some big reaction to this development last week, and that's for a few reasons. One is that everyone knew it was coming. It had already been decreed that Negro League statistics, as best as they could be culled and verified, were going to be included along with Major League Baseball, but also understand that those statistics, the ones that were there in place before, had previously absorbed a half dozen other leagues statistics along the way. So this wasn't some great big outlier the way I think some people might be interpreting over the past few days. The statistics are for the major leagues, plural. And that has not ever just been limited to National League and American League. The second reason I wasn't blown away by this is that I've never not considered Mr. Gibson's achievements. A few years ago, I made a trip to Kansas City to cover a Pirates Royal series, and I made time to invest an afternoon at the Negro Leagues Museum, which I can't recommend strongly enough, but especially if you're fortunate enough, as I was that day, to get a personal tour from Bob Kendrick, who's the president of that museum. The man was so excited to have someone who's a reporter from Pittsburgh being there. As he said, this museum just as easily could have been or should have been in Pittsburgh with the rich history that we've had here with the Negro Leagues. And he began by walking me through a field, a simulated field of statues with one player at each position. And of course, he began In my case, not with others, he usually starts with the pitcher, Satchel Paige. He started mine with the catcher on purpose. And he said of Mr. Gibson, as we're standing there by his statue, some people called him the Black Babe Ruth, and maybe they should have called Babe Ruth the White Josh Gibson. Mr. Gibson was said to have hit as many as 800 home runs across the span of of his playing career that included all kinds of barnstorming and exhibitions because that's how the Negro Leagues teams in large part made their actual money. So that didn't catch me off guard either. You know, the fact that Mr. Gibson was as great as what now some more people are beginning to recognize. And the third and final point that I have here is that I've been in frequent contact over the years with Sean Gibson, who is Mr. Gibson's great grandson still lives in the area, still very active in supporting his great-grandfather's legacy to the extent that even after this recognition, he and others are pushing the Baseball Writers Association of America, of which I'm a longtime member, to name the MVP award, the National League MVP award, in Mr. Gibson's honor. I couldn't be more in favor of that idea myself. So I I wasn't about to have some big, massive awakening or a 180 moment or anything to that effect over any aspect of this. It's wonderful that it happened, but it wasn't going to bowl me over. I've had several of you reach out and ask what my thoughts are on this part of it or that part of it. And I'm going to keep this very simple. Back in COVID times, when the Daily Shot podcasts were born because mostly I was 
bored and looking for something to do. I couldn't report on games or anything like that. So I locked myself in a closet and began doing these recordings. One of the subjects that came up on one of the earliest daily shots of pirates was the somewhat common, let's have your Mount Rushmore. Let's have your guys who are the four biggest, best names or whatever in franchise history. And I gave them, and I got to tell you, the response wasn't exactly positive, like at all. In fact, I can't recall of a single person who said, yeah, that match is my own. And the simple reason for that was that I took Hannes Wagner, who's the greatest player in Pittsburgh's baseball history. I took Roberto Clemente. I took Willie Stargell. And I took Mr. Gibson. To which there was a whole lot of, well, he didn't play for the Pirates. Of course he didn't play for the Pirates. He couldn't play for the Pirates. He would have played for the Pirates. He should have played for the Pirates. And while you can't rewrite history, and you absolutely don't want to soften history, you don't want to delude yourself into thinking that any of the machinations that are ongoing right now can undo the damage that was already done, you'd better believe I'm comfortable acknowledging that when you're talking about Pittsburgh baseball history, and that is always going to be equivalent to the Pirates, that Mr. Gibson would have been all of this and possibly even more, maybe much more, had he been able to play for the Pirates. When I tell you that now, even though it's four years old, it probably doesn't come with the same, uh, what's the term I'm looking for here, shock value or surprise element to it that it did then. And that's good. That's good. That's progress when it comes to recognizing both the wrongs of that era and the rights that can be done all these years later. We're having a historical discussion right now, and we're including players in the Negro Leagues. We're just doing it a century too late. We come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q comes from John in Orlando who says, DK, I understand that it might be seen as wise for the Pirates to deal some of their minor league pitching prospects for better major league hitting. But might they also not be better served holding on to their pitching prospects since pitching is the hardest thing for teams to acquire and is insurance in the event of future injuries? Would it be a better route to take on salaries from teams trying to cut payroll at the deadline to acquire hitting for lesser prospects than to spend north of $100 million filling out the lineup next offseason. John, don't, don't let them hear you is all I have to say here. Don't let them hear you. This is the stuff that they want. They want to be let off the hook. They want to have and feel no pressure. I'm going to be just bitingly clear about this. They have Jared Jones pitching tonight against the Dodgers. I'll be covering that for DK Pittsburgh Sports. They have Paul Skeens going tomorrow night. They have Mitch Keller. They have Bailey Falter. In the modern playoff format, the Pirates might be one of the three or four teams that you would least want to face in those brief series. Think about it. You don't have to think back very far to what that's like, where all you need is a pitcher going against you, shoving the ball up your rear end, 
and not allowing you to do a thing for six, seven innings, and then the game is won. The game is won. You don't need much. We've seen that already from this team. You don't need much to win when these guys are on the mound. Of course, the Pirates don't offer much when those guys are on the mound, but maybe it's time that we stopped making it okay for them to not try their hardest. This is the time to add to the offense right now. Not worrying or waiting about who's going to get hurt. They're not hurt now. They're pitching fine just now. And if they were to get into the playoffs and look, they're nowhere near the Brewers in the Central, but they're within a couple of games of the wild card. All you need to do is get in. All you need to do is get in. So just because they're treating their season as if it's some extended training camp, let's see if we can get Rowdy Telez going. Make sure we get him 200, 300 at bats. Let's try to get some value out of this contract as opposed to, you know, trying to win games and getting into the playoffs. And respectfully here, my man, you're not only letting them off the hook for when it's okay to start pushing for winning, this is year five of this front office, but you're even letting them go on the payroll thing. Like, we don't need to be spending $100 million. Let's not do that. Let's not spend $100 million. Why? Why are you worried about Bob Nutting's bank account? Have you looked at what the Brewers and the Reds and other teams in similar markets, similar revenue bases are spending? They're all, all of them, 25 to 30 million higher than the Pirates. Do not worry about what they would be spending. And for that matter, do not worry about their pitching prospects. Because this is year five. This is when those prospects are supposed to bring you value in one form or another, meaning they're either here and contributing or they're trade bait for whatever you're missing. This is that time, not 2025, not 2026, right now. And if these guys either can't do it or don't want to do it, then get rid of them and find people who can and will finish the job. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. 